we're talking about patterns of evolution or patterns of diversification, which is really our main, main focus on this dot point here. So we've learned about evolution across the scale from microevolution to macroevolution. So we could have to recall that microevolution occurs when allele frequencies change within a population, therefore they change the observable phenotypes. And this can happen in a number of ways. We've got mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and various modes of natural selection. So the stabilizing directional and disruptive uh, selection there. So eventually over time, populations can become reproductively isolated with one another and through a range of modes of speciation, species can diverge from one another completely. Now as we keep zooming out to look at a larger scale we have to consider that over time different species begin to diverge further from one another but as adaptive radiation occurs the diversification of the descendants from the ancestors species may begin to actually look extremely different from one another or they might actually develop traits that are similar to one another and they begin to show similarities between unrelated species and these long-term diversification changes happen in some patterns and these are our focus for this lesson we are discussing four patterns of diversification divergent evolution convergent evolution parallel evolution and co-evolution now, divergent evolution occurs when differences in the phenotype and genotype of an organism accrue over time. So eventually they reach a really critical point where so many of those changes have accrued that gene flow stops, mutation, natural selection, and genetic drift all make their own allele frequencies change and speciation occurs, at which point the ancestral lineage splits. So then the organism begins to evolve independently due to different um, selection pressures that are in their environment that they're exposed to and they diverge right and their evolutionary pathways move away from one another now animals that show homologous features show evidence of divergence so looking at the limb formation of many mammals you know we can see a clue that there had there had been a common ancestor in their recent past we're also talking organisms like darwin's finches which he discovered uh, several different species of in the galapagos islands and their beak shape and size reflected their diet all of which varied based on their slightly different habitat indicating that they had previously shared a common ancestor and had since diverged so many native australians Australian marsupials show really clear similarities as well, but enough divergences to see genetic and phenotypic differences. So if we look at, say, the koala and the wombat, so the koalas are over here and the wombat, even though they have diverged, you know, their most recent common ancestor is back here, so like 45 million years ago, um, as opposed to, say, if we compared the bandicoots and the numbat, where their most recent ancestor was there. Now, convergent evolution occurs when natural selection in unrelated or distantly related groups of organisms from different ancestral lineage, they actually evolve similar adaptations due to them being exposed to similar selection pressures in their environment. Okay, And this is where we start to see analogous structures that have similarity in form due to function. So we might be talking anatomical and physiological adaptations of, say, aquatic animals like sharks and dolphins. They have similar body shapes. They have really streamlined bodies. Even, say, penguins show similar body shapes, um, you know, because they can swim Swim, but they're not actually closely related. So the shark and the dolphin here have diverged many, many years ago, millions of years ago, but they end up having that same selection pressure of being in the water and therefore have similar body shapes. So some other examples of this include the ability to eat ants, right? Echidnas, numbats, pangolins, they all have similar sort of nasal structures or mouth structures there to help them eat because they have a similar diet. And you can see that this skill or this adaptation has popped up in so many different places when you look at that ancestral lineage. Now, desert plants have similar leaf structures to avoid losing water in dry, hot conditions, even though they are not all coming from the same ancestor. And there's flying mammals like the sugar glider and flying squirrel. They have similar wing arm sort of structures, despite not actually being closely related. Parallel evolution occurs when a divergence occurs in the species, and then the two organisms that are new species actually evolve independently of one another, but they develop similar characteristics with the same, sort of the same degree of similarity is maintained. And they're organisms that share a close ancestral history, but they live in separate yet similar environments. So even though they're taking on their own path, they end up evolving similar traits. And sometimes these examples are really hard to distinguish from convergent evolution, uh, particularly when the ancestral heritage of an organism is still up for debate. 
So some examples of this type of evolution are domesticated rice species. They originally came from a common ancestor and then various varieties grew all over Asia and Africa. Now phenotypes developed very separately but in similar environments and then selection pressures, which is domestication, we've taken them, we've cultivated them. They end up showing similar phenotypes and even the complexity of the eye across many species, particularly say the octopus and humans, um, the octopus has evolved its complex camera eye independently of vertebra, uh, you know, vertebrates like us, but it's estimated the eye has evolved, you know, somewhere over 50 different times, right, in species like flies, flatworms, mollusks, vertebrates, all those kinds of things. Now, co-evolution occurs between species which share a close interaction. Their lives are intertwined because of some close relationship. So it might be talking mutualism, predator-prey relationships, con uh, competition, and parasite-host relationships. And as one species evolves some advantageous trait, the other one kind of has to keep up so they're not left behind and they evolve together. So you might be talking about an animal that's, you know, a prey um, it's say, you know, the slow ones got eaten by the predator. So then the next generation, only the fast genes are being passed on. And that means that the predator actually then has to keep up with new uh, generations that are slightly faster. And therefore the predator has to get faster as well. So in this situation, we've got um, monarchs being inedible to birds. Birds feed on the mimic butterfly. And that situation is happening there. Now, selection pressure is exerting itself onto both of the organisms simultaneously. So the two species evolve together in a reciprocal response to that selection pressure. And there's so many examples of really interesting co-evolutionary relationships. So flowering plants and their pollinators, so insects, bees, and even sometimes bats, um, you know, some of them are eating the seed of the plant as they pollinate. Others are actually communicating, so the plants and the insects are communicating between one another. Um, there's little proboscis that develop when uh, flowers have really long nectar tubes, like in this situation here. Some flowers develop really distinct colours to which certain pollinators' insect eyes are really sensitive, and even they can mimic the coloration of some species in insects to trick males to go and land and undergo pseudocopulation, and so they're inadvertently pollinating at the same time. And with flowers that bats pollinate, you know, they've evolved to open at night to match the bat's nocturnal behavior. Now, sometimes multiple types of diversification patterns can be at work in the same organism. So in this situation, it's taken three different traits and said, well, this is all developing in different types of ways. If we look across the whole scale of changes seen in evolution, it's important for us to understand how each stage occurs, but also make some really clear links between these processes and what leads from one thing to the other. Okay. So in this one, covered one specific one, but again, all of these are extremely linked.